Welcome officially, everybody, to our second Deeper Inquiry series, which is an ongoing virtual activist meetup that digs deeper into some pressing political issues. We want to spark honest conversation and uh, have some experience sharing around difficult subject matter and build wider community ties across the European grassroots activist scene. And I just wanted to frame this session with a bit of text from David Graeber, who published his last article uh, sometime last year during the pandemic. And I think it speaks to the wider theme of grassroots economics that we wanna touch on today. So he writes, how about this? Why don't we stop treating it as entirely normal that the more obviously one's work benefits others, the less one is likely to be paid for it. Or insisting that financial markets are the best way to direct long-term investment, even as they are propelling to destroy most life on Earth. Why not instead, once the current emergency is declared over, we actually remember what we've learned, that if the economy means anything, it is the way we provide each other with what we need to be alive in every sense of the term. And what we call the market is largely just a way of tabulating the aggregate desires of rich people, most of whom are at least slightly pathological, and the most powerful of whom were already completing the designs for the bunkers they plan to escape to if we continue to be foolish enough to believe their minions lectures that we were all collectively too lacking in basic common sense to do anything about oncoming catastrophes. This time around, can we just please ignore them? I almost dropped the F-bomb there, uh, which wasn't part of the original quote, for added emphasis. Most of the work we're currently doing is dream work. It exists only for its own sake, or to make rich people feel good about themselves, or to make poor people feel bad about themselves. And if we simply stopped, it might be possible to make ourselves a much more reasonable set of promises, for instance, to create an economy that lets us actually take care of the people who are taking care of us. And to add to that, a wider frame of this discussion that we want to keep in mind is how can we make economics and analysis of finance more relevant to social movements active today? Often there is shallow analysis or not deep enough analysis of economics and finance in social movements that are espousing systems change, radical system change. And this is a weak spot oftentimes. And so what can we do to address that and be a more powerful, holistic systems changing movement? So the relevance to social movements, grassroots movements is what we're looking for today. And with no further ado, I would like to welcome our two speakers. The first one being Della Duncan, a renegade economist based in San Francisco, Bay Area, and a host producer of the Upstream podcast, um, also a collaborator of Guerrilla. And uh, she was a student and then a faculty member of the MA in Economics for Transition at Schumacher College and is an alternative economics teacher and consultant. Hi, Della. And we also have Brett, uh, Brett Scott, an author, journalist, and financial hacker who explores the intersections between money systems, finance, and digital technology. He published the work, a work in 2013 called The Heretic's Guide to Global Finance, Hacking the Future of Money, and is working on a new book about the war on cash and the meeting of big tech and big finance. And so we're going to have Della talk about alternative economic systems, and then Brett's going to take us into the murky waters of finance. So uh, I'm going to pass the baton over to Della. Take it away. Thank you, Ivan, and good to be with you all. I'm also going to start with a quote. This is a Yannis uh, Varoufakis quote about economics. Uh, so I'll dive in. We must all understand that empowering citizens to speak authoritatively about the economy is a prerequisite for democracy and a precondition to the good society. There are no economic experts. There are experts when it comes to building a bridge. 
if you want to build a bridge, you can't do it democratically because the bridge will collapse and it'll be a major crime. But the economy is the way in which we organize social power. Who does what to whom? Who has power over their lives and who doesn't? And that is a question of how we run our society. That is a question about democracy. So if we were to accept that there is a group of experts and we have to defer to them when it comes to economic matters, then effectively we accept oligarchy. I'm starting with that as an invitation for us to just have this conversation today um, to speak authoritatively about the economy and to learn together. So I'm going to share my screen now. I just have a tiny, tiny bit of slides just to guide us in this, uh, in this conversation. Give me one second. There we go. All right. And I'm going to press present. All right. So this is not the truth with a capital T. I'm starting with that as just a way to say that I wanted to share some reflections and thoughts, but I in no way want this to be proselytizing or dogmatic, really an invitation. So these are some thoughts and reflections, but they are not the truth with a capital T. So feel free to make sense of them in your own experience, in your own work, in your own organizing and see what makes sense to you. So also by way of introduction, uh, the podcast that I host is called the Upstream Podcast. So I just wanna bring in the upstream metaphor. So this is a metaphor that has really guided my work as an alternative economist. And I just offer it to you all in case the way of thinking is helpful. So the metaphor, the upstream metaphor, comes from public health, at least that's where I learned it from. And it's a metaphor where you imagine you're standing at the bank of a river and you see someone float by who's drowning. So you jump in and pull them to shore. Pretty soon you look up, you see more people floating down the river drowning and you jump in and pull them to shore. Eventually, there's just so many people floating down the river drowning that someone or a group of you need to go upstream to figure out why is everyone falling in in the first place. So I heard this metaphor and I was really touched by economic challenges that I was noticing, witnessing, experiencing. And I've been on that journey uh, going upstream ever since. So I just invite in case this is a useful way of thinking to look at root causes to intervene there for systemic intervention. Um, you know, what that root cause uh, what that going upstream might mean for you in your work. And just to share, when, when I just thought about this presentation, I thought maybe, maybe it'd be interesting to share some things that I've found um, as I've gone upstream through conversations with folks, through visiting different projects around the world, through interviews, documentaries. Down at the bottom, we have some of the downstream challenges of our time, climate change, war, depression, suicide, police violence, slavery. And you may have many others, particularly that your work addresses or looks at. And then as I've gone upstream, we have systemic um, oppression and the challenges of racism, sexism, ecocide, et cetera. So that's kind of an upstream of some of these downstream challenges. And then going further upstream, we have the system of capitalism, which um, racism, sexism, and ecocide are, are a part of, right? And then as I've gone further upstream uh, and in conversation with folks, I've found per personally some very eco-spiritual or spiritual questions around our disconnection, disconnection with ourselves uh, and our sense of purpose or contribution, disconnection with the web of life, with nature, with ecology, with the earth, if you wanna call it Gaia, othering, so kind of disconnection and then separation objectifying, commodifying of people, of other people, of, of nature, and then supremacy. So supremacy, this kind of domination over or power over way of thinking, of course, that would then lead to racism, sexism, ecocide, et cetera. And then of course, scarcity thinking as well, kind of the sense of not enoughness or always wanting more. So I just share these, um, maybe we can talk more in the breakout sessions, but just wanted to share uh, where I've, the journey that I've gone on so far and just some things that I've found. 
in case they're interesting or um, thought provoking for you all. And I wanted to share, as uh, Ivan said, you know, what would be helpful for this group, uh, this community. And just want to really bow to all of the work that you all are doing, and it's good to be in community with you. And so I just thought, what could be helpful? What could be a few invitations in this realm of alternative economics that you could take on and bring into your work? So these are the three invitations, um, and I'll go through each of them. So the first is to rethink economics, second is to become growth agnostic, and the last is to embrace accountability. So I'm just going to go to my own screen now, uh, just while I share those 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 invitations. So, rethinking economics. So, and that frame, rethinking economics. There is also maybe you already know about it, but a wonderful student movement around the world of folks rethinking economics. And I think this goes back to that uh, Giannis Varoufakis quote of reclaiming and rethinking economics. So I invite all of us to challenge traditional economic thinking, whether that's in newspapers or in classrooms. Um, to just question it and challenge it. I think that's a, a good practice to have. Um, and I like to recall that when Adam Smith really founded the Department of Economics, that he was a moral philosopher and that economics was in this realm of moral philosophy. And I find that helpful to yeah, bring in this lens of philosophy into economic thinking and to really ask these questions of what is work, what is value, um, what, what should be the goal, what's the paradigm, the mentality, like just bringing in all of these questions, how are decisions made, I find them really fascinating to bring in a lens of what would a moral philosophical lens to economic thought and practice look and feel like, how might we bring that in. Uh, another way of rethinking economics, which many of you may know already, is uh, the root of economics. So just bringing in the, the etymology of economics. So we have oikos and nomos. Uh, so coming from Greek, economics, oikos and nomos, um, meaning management of our home. And I want to call in Kate Rayworth, uh, who many of you may know, renegade economist. That's actually where I got my kind of... Um, identification, I call myself a renegade economist, really inspired by Kate Rayworth and his work, her work. And um, so she speaks about this, but as do many others. But yeah, this question of today, knowing how interconnected our economic systems are, our financial systems, as Brett will speak more about, um, that we must think of managing our home as our planetary home. And we must think both in this global perspective, but what is our each individual role in that management of the home? Who is responsible for that management of the home? So this goes also with that Giannis Varoufakis quote of like, who, who should we, you know, should we delegate economic matters to a group of experts or are we all a part of this managing of our home, of our planetary home, including the more than human world um, and the, the carbon cycle, right? They're all a part of the managing of the home. So what if we were to rethink economics in that realm. Another rethinking economics invitation that I love um, comes from this idea that uh, we have multiple economies and when we, uh, it, 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 the, yeah, this idea comes from two feminist authors that write under, wrote under the same pen name of Gibson Graham, Gibson Graham. And they wrote the, this work around how we perform diverse economies that we actually are embedded in and, and act within other many economies all the time. And they say that when we speak about capitalism as the dominant economic system, we actually give more power to it as if it were this kind of like all encompassing thing. And when they offer, Gibson Graham offers this alternative frame of us performing diverse economies then we can think about the ways that we actually have many alternative economies that we perform or participate in all the time. So the care economy, for example, when we take care of children or elderly folks, or the gift economy, when we gift give to one another, or we donate, or we contribute in some way, the solidarity economy, the new economy, the next economy, the feminist economy, right? And so this idea of rethinking economics as many economies and seeing how we participate in and perform multiple economies. 
brings the power out of capitalism and empowers these alternative economies. And uh, I think we can think of it as like, how do we participate more and more in these alternative economies? And then also how do we uh, make them accessible and invite others to be able to participate and uh, be within these alternative economies. Um, and then the, the other part of rethinking economics is the idea of work. And Ivan, thank you for bringing in that David Graeber quote and David Graeber's work on uh, work on work um, is really powerful. And so I just wanna call in the, this uh, frame or idea of right livelihood. This is one view that I've really found helpful in my own life. So I just offer it as an invitation for you all. So right livelihood coming from the Buddhist uh, tradition for me is that work can be seen as part of our spiritual path. It can be our action in the world coming from our, our, our uh, deeper purpose or spiritual nature. So it's not necessarily what's monetized or financialized. It's all of our contributions, all of our service to life on earth. So I've just found um, an investigation of what is my right livelihood path and supporting others in their right livelihood path to be really a powerful way of reframing work, rethinking work um, as our contribution. And so if that's a useful frame, I offer that to you. My second invitation, so the first again was rethink economics. The second is become growth agnostic. Uh, this is one that I really love to think about on multiple levels, multiple scales. The term growth agnostic, um, I heard from Kate Rayworth, and it's really in this realm of a post-growth uh, mentality or world where if we change the goal of an economic system, for example, to well-being or happiness for people on the planet, then growth no longer becomes that goal and we can become growth agnostic. Growth can be a means to an end, but it is no longer the end in itself. So obviously on the uh, larger systemic realm of a nation state or a society or the, the globe. There's many efforts of this. I'm sure folks maybe have heard of donut economics. That's one of the big ones right now. And I'm part of the California Donut Economics Coalition. We're currently doing a donut selfie for, uh, for California. So we're, we're trying to measure what are the human needs of California that are being met? Um, where, where are the deficits? And then how do we meet those needs within the realm of the ecological boundaries in our state? So that's a little bit about the donut, but if folks don't know about that, I encourage you to check that out more. There's other movements though around changing the goal, but I, I wanna just introduce this idea of becoming growth agnostic in our own lives. I've just found that uh, you know because wealth uh, is so highly unequal and such uh, uh, such a root cause of so much suffering in the world that rethinking, you know, what is sufficiency? What is enoughness? How do we meet our needs in non-monetized ways can be really helpful for folks. And of course, I wouldn't want to leave wealth redistribution to the wealthy, like as if they, they suddenly wake up and give away their wealth. Um, obviously we need some structures of accountability and to change things systemically. But I have found that just inviting folks to think about sufficiency and contentment and simplicity um, right now is a, is a very helpful invitation of a paradigm shift. So if this feels at all relevant to you or to your work, if you, ever, if you work with folks who have a lot of wealth, to invite them to think about their needs, what are their needs that are being met, what are their needs that they could meet on a non-financialized, non-market way, and um, what is sufficiency? What is enoughness? So really invite them to think about growth agnosticism or being post-growth in their own life. And that's something I'm exploring, but I just invite us all to think about that um, as we look towards what would it mean to live in a one planet living lifestyle for all of us around the globe. And with that, I wanna um, introduce one of my favorite uh, books right now in case it's useful or, thought or helpful for everyone. Um, I just put it in the chat. This is a book called um, How on Earth, Not-for-Profit World by 2050. And it's Jennifer Hinton and Donnie McLaren. And um, the PDF is the kind of the draft of that book that's available. 
And I just love thinking, you know, imagining this idea of waking up or in 2050, where there's no profit, where all profit is redirected to social or environmental good. Um, this, this idea is just really inspiring to me. It goes at this post-growth mentality of enoughness and sufficiency, but it also, it, it harnesses that creativity uh, that comes with folks who have entrepreneurial skills or who are excited by kind of creating businesses, but it says, how can we direct that energy? How can we harness that for social and environmental good? So the main model for this, in case it's useful to any of you in your work, is the not-for-profit slash business hybrid model, where you imagine some sort of profit generating activity that could pay the folks involved with that living wages, supply chains are ethical, um, it's all you know copacetic, maybe uh, a worker self-directed nonprofit, right? Uh, or a worker cooperative model. And then the profit has been directed to um, a project of social or environmental good. That combination is so exciting and inspiring to me. Also because nonprofits, as many of you may be involved with, are many times um, um, have to be connected with uh, either foundations or grant funding or donations, right? So creating profit generating activity within them can be liberating. It can create income streams that are more um, diverse and untethered. So just wanna share that as something that's been inspiring to me and check that book out for more if you wanna learn more about that. The last invitation that I have um, is something that I'm thinking about a lot and I'd love to continue talking about it in the breakout rooms. It's a, the invitation is to embrace accountability. So I have a story about this. I have been working with a traditional nonprofit. Um, it's a nonprofit called Mamatsana Vibrant Woman. They're a group of black and brown um, female uh, doulas so uh, birth support folks in Austin, Texas, and they wanted a model that, um, that mirrored the, the solidarity and the collectivity of the work they were trying to do, supporting um, people of color in their births in Austin, Texas. So I've been working with them on the uh, worker self-directed nonprofit model. So taking on the, uh, the insights and, and the uh, decision-making and, and the beauty of worker cooperatives, but bringing that into a nonprofit setting. And I've been working with them on that transition. And I just found that time and time again, the biggest challenge was accountability. It was just moving to a more horizontal governance model. Um, accountability just kept coming up as a challenge for folks. And I wondered about this. I was like, what, you know, I had to look into what do cooperatives do about accountability? What do other uh, worker self-directed nonprofits? But it just brought up this really strong question around how do we hold each other accountable in this work? And I got to ask Richard Wolf, as many of you know, Richard Wolf, uh, economic update, uh, professor of economics at the New School, Marxist. And I asked him about this. I said, what about accountability? And he said, you're absolutely right. This is a challenge. This is a challenge in the movement for the new economy or the solidarity economy or the cooperative economy. It is a challenge. It is related to the fact that we don't learn it. We don't learn those skills when we're young. We don't learn how to hold ourselves accountable or one another accountable. And in fact, I kind of felt like, is this the one kind of benefit to capitalism that when you have the bosses in that structure, then accountability is built in this kind of managerial role. Obviously still the question of who holds the bosses accountable, of course. And of course, that's why we have unions, et cetera. But it just, it was like, what is this? And so I just share that as um, one thing that I'm really curious about is how do we practice um, to learn the skills of self-accountability and accountability of others? And how do we bring that in? And yeah, it just feels like a very alive um, thing in my own work and curious if that lands for anyone. And of course, I feel called to bring in Eleanor Ostrom and her work on on her insight on finding that we can work with commons, we can manage commons collectively and sustainably and well, but it takes accountability. It takes structures of accountability to be able to do that work. That's kind of one of the main insights to the work that she's done. So yeah, in summary, I just wanted to offer those invitations. I know this is not an exhaustive 
uh, presentation on alternative economics, but they're what's alive for me and they're what I thought might be useful for you all. So again, I invite you to rethink economics. I invite you to become growth agnostic in your own work, in your own life, and in the movements that you're in, the activism that you're doing. And I invite you to embrace accountability and to help us uh, develop the skills uh, for accountability. So I want to close with a poem because um, I know this economic stuff can be uh, quite heady. So good to bring in the poetic, uh, the artistic. So I'm going to close with a poem. This is a poem that I wrote. Uh, it's called What is Economics? Uh, and it just hopefully invites some other ways of thinking about economics. So I invite you to close your eyes or relax, whatever feels good for you. And just uh, this is a poem called What is Economics? Economics is about our relationship with ourselves. It's about how we use our time, what we do for leisure, our pace, about our ratio of being to doing, about our connection with our passions, our hobbies, about that which we call our own, about our locus of control, about our sense of self-worth, about the rhythm of our days, our relationship with seasons, about how we introduce ourselves, about the conditions of our past, the quality of our present, how we envision our future, about our freedoms and our constraints, about how we meet our needs, about our role in society, our right livelihood, or our mythopoetic identity. Economics is about our relationship with each other. It's about whether we see collaborators or competitors, separation or solidarity, interbeing or alienation. It's about our level of trust, about the strength of our democracy, about how we relate to power, about how we manage our housework, our child rearing, our commons, about how we care and how we get cared for, about what we give and what we get and how much we share. Economics is about our relationship with the earth. It's about our connection with land, our bioregions, our watersheds, about our sense of belonging, about what we build and how we build it, about what and how we eat, where our food comes from and what happens to our waste, about whether we see the natural world as a supply house or a sewer, a battlefield or a lover, an animate being, Gaia, or our larger ecological self. Economics has the ability to isolate, subjugate, unite, and empower. It's myth and fact, crisis and opportunity, alive and lifeless, systemic and personal. Economics is not simply the bottom line, the marketplace, the profit margin, or the banknote, and it's not something outside of us. Economics is valueful, valuable, and here. Thanks all. Thank you. Good to Della. be with you. you. Excited for more conversations. And with that, I'll hand back to Brett and Ivan. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna segue over to Brett. I just want to um, thank you for the wide array of resources. Which, again, to answer the question of what movements can do to deepen their economic narratives, is also dedicate people in the movements to deepen their knowledge of alternatives. And what sticks out is that thing of if we constantly keep framing. Um, capitalism is the only or dominant structure, we are giving it un undue power and credit um, when so many alternatives do exist. So thank you for that. And thank you for the poetry. As you can see, I'm having a battle with this shadow that is moving um, as a sundial. Uh, <laughs> yay. And um, I will now pass over to Brett, who also has an amazing newsletter that has been contributing directly to uh, reducing my anxiety around finance, like math anxiety is an actual clinical condition in school that I had. Um, and I have financial anxiety as well. And uh, so if you want uh, it dispelled a little bit, you should follow Brett's altered states of monetary consciousness. Um, and I hand over to Brett. Scott. Cool. Thanks. Did you say you had math anxiety? Did I get that right? I had that, I had that as well. I actually almost failed maths wow. at school. I had major. Huh? 
major math anxiety. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I only narrowly scrape by with uh, in maths. Strange, people often think when you do finance stuff that somehow you're into maths, but like finance has got almost nothing to do with mathematics. It's a sort of like common mythology around finance that somehow it's because it's because money comes with numbers. So people then often think that somehow there's a link between maths and, and finance. Um, which incidentally forms part of the like power structure, psychological power structure of these systems, because they seem so like technical rather than political. Um, so first, first thing to say, finance is not about maths. Um, <laughs> if that helps. Uh, I haven't really prepared very much to be honest. I was thinking I might just like riff it. Um, and I mean, partly I haven't prepared very much because I've been, I'm in the midst of editing a book, which is like a really intense process. So it's quite hard to like, um, in the midst of doing that to kind of like think about other things. So I'm just going to try and like, like uh, work with that. Um, oh, Natalie just popped into my screen. <laughs> it's funny. Um, I, I actually, I know various people on this call, it seems. Um, I thought maybe what I could try to do is like, I mean, Ivan asked me to talk about GameStop. I don't really want to spend very much time talking about GameStop, to be honest. Like the, the GameStop affair almost totally bypassed me. Um, and although The Guardian did ask me to write a piece about it because like the news media works on this, like they churn opinion all the time. So I basically ended up writing a piece on, on GameStop, which I think you included in, in the, I don't know if you sent that to people, um, but like uh, where I, I, did, I did produce some commentary on the GameStop affair recently, basically look, looking at like to what extent it could be considered some kind of financial protest movement. Um, and so I could talk a little bit about that if you guys want me to, but like, I don't necessarily have to. I did, I did write a book in 2013. Um, I've got a copy here, which is called The Heretic's Guide to Global Finance, Hacking the Future of Money, where I did actually speak quite a lot about um, different forms of financial activism, by which I would like meant, like, you know, sort of tactical ways you could take control of financial instruments or financial vehicles of various sorts to mess with the financial sector. Um, and some of those things are deeper than others. Like some of those interventions you can make are more profound than others. Um, so I guess when the GameStop thing came up, a lot of people were kind of like, oh, this is an example of some kind of financial activism. Um, and to some extent it sort of was. Um, albeit with quite a different ethos to a lot of the stuff I was writing about in the Heretic's Guide to Global Finance. Um, and yeah, I guess my Heretic's Guide to Global Finance was more traditional in its sort of activist orientation. It has more that kind of like earnestness that activists often have, which is like, you know, harness the financial markets for social good or for like some kind of like progressive purpose. Whereas the sort of the GameStop affair was just like, kind of like this nihilistic feeling, which is just like, fuck everything, who cares? Like that's the kind of vibe I get from GameStop. It doesn't feel like a kind of um, directed sort of movement, but I think that's very important to take notice of because um, it is true that a lot of people on the left have kind of like lost touch with the sort of, actually that the right wing has been far better at mobilizing people recently in terms of this forms of these kind of like these populist sort of narratives around finance. Um, most notably, you're seeing it in Bitcoin right now, which is completely right wing in the way it's framed, but it's currently being seen as one of the most sort of um, cutting edge forms of financial activism, all right? But it actually replicates so much of the existing dynamics of a system, all right? So there is a moment right now, and I'm kind of just like waffling, but there's a moment right now to try and redefine a more progressive version of financial activism because a lot of it has been taken over by forces which aren't going in any particularly interesting direction. Um, I want to luckily circle back though, after that slightly, uh, you know, unfinished statement to something Della was saying about economics, because um, 
and, and the sort of the attempts and the alternative econ economics movements to redefine what economics is. And I actually, I come from a anthropology background, which is uh, quite useful if you're looking at uh, economic systems, because economic anthropology in general has a very, very different orientation to economics than the economics discipline does. So economic anthropology, actually, if you want, if you want to get the basic deal of something like economic anthropology, all you need to do is imagine yourself about 7,000 years ago as a hunter gatherer on a vast open plain where there's no private property. All right, like that's the best way to understand economics is to start from the position where there are no markets. All right, and then to think to yourself, like what is the lived experience of this person? What is it like to wake up in the morning and find that the entire landscape around you has no property developers, all right? And that nobody technically owns it. And that what your job is, what your quote unquote economy is, is you gotta go out and find a way to survive essentially. All right, and you're in a small band of people. Now, I mean, you can kind of like um, make a crude version of this, but like this is a useful uh, this is a useful thought experiment to sort of think to yourself about like, well, what exactly would I do? I would literally have to go and provision for myself off the land along with a bunch of other people and somehow collaborate with them. And that's the basic root of all this. Of the starting point of economic anthropology is to say that what we call economics is people trying to survive on the land together okay and then from there you can find different ways to do that but that's always the starting point what tends to be called economics however is a particular discipline that formed in the context of a pre-existing economic system okay so what is referred to as economics is a kind of like 19th century discipline that emerged in the context of a pre-existing capitalist market all right, and in that context, well, that context is invisibilized. It's just taken for granted. So everything that's referred to as economics is basically a person sitting in 19th century Europe with a whole bunch of pre-existing assumptions, a deeply ingrained monetary system, which they've always experienced from the moment they've been born. And they're taking that as the invisible baseline from which everything else emerges. Okay, and that's what then gets called economics. This is why there's a big battle between economic anthropology and economics is that economic anthropology says stuff and actually people like Gibson Graham and stuff, this is, this is the, whole, the whole point is that, no, there's all these other forms that coexist with this and also preceded this. And what you are referring to, it's, it's a little bit like, if you imagine like, um, you know, when like a classical musician says something like the only for the only scale is the tempered you know uh, scale of western music with the like triple clef you know which is all these absurd systems that were developed for classical music all right and it's like as if like you know um indian microtonal music doesn't exist like this is like how economics operates it sits in this world where there's literally this invisibilized baseline which is considered to be the the, the way things work um, so I'm kind of like ranting on, but the, the one of the things that's most invisibilized in the economics in the economics discipline is actually the monetary system. If you look at a standard economics textbook, it doesn't even talk about the monetary system, at least in the microeconomics textbook. It's not even in there. It's so taken for granted that it's considered not even part of a market. Okay, um, and this is a lot of a lot of the work that I do is around um, showing the actual structure of the monetary system and how this is a thing that you actually build, all right? And it's not just some kind of like um, invisible system that has uh, emerges from markets, okay? So one of the, the core battles that goes on in monetary theory, which is, which is at the underpinning of how then financial systems start to get, get built is in the economics discipline, the, the, the starting assumption is that markets exist, all right? And then from there, they use that to induce a theory of money. So they say markets exist, therefore money must have been brought into being to serve a market, okay? So they see monetary systems as a product of markets. 
Whereas if you go into the world of anthropology and the sort of the kind of like the, 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 the deep kind of like um, politics of money, you see that markets themselves are induced by monetary systems often. They, they come afterwards, all right? So actually um, monetary systems form the core of market systems, okay? Um, and then, so you got to then look at that, what are at the core of monetary systems? What's the actual structures in the middle of monetary systems that are then causing all these capitalist markets to kind of orbit around it, all right? And that's a much better orientation to have is to see that money precedes markets rather than the other way around. Of course, it's more complex than this, but this is just a really, this is a, as a sort of an antidote to the economic discipline um, for you guys. Um, I could talk about like all the layers of finance, but I've, I've already talked for 10 minutes. So like maybe I'll just do five more minutes on some of my new projects. If that's, I mean, I don't know what's best, but. First of all, I just want to say you say you when you say you say you're ranting, it's like it's a bad thing. Uh, we encourage ranting in these calls. And second of all, um, yeah, whatever is new and whatever you think might be relevant to people who are trying to parse some sense out of sure, all this. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, the financial system itself has about like eight layers of complexity and like I could sit, I could sit and like discuss how like GameStop share works or whatever, but it's kind of like, it's not necessarily the most important thing. I mean, I used to work in derivative contracts, which are like sitting at around layer, layer seven, layer eight of finance. These are highly abstract, large scale contracts, but like you got to, you got to kind of see finance as being, um, if you if you start from this assumption that there are these monetary systems that 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 are locked into us finance is operating upon these systems often to create or manipulate human bodies all right so this is why i'll often use um i often use nervous system metaphors for this uh economists and actually many people ordinarily often use blood metaphors for money which is a terrible terrible mistake so people often have these phrases where they speak about money flowing and like these like circulatory system metaphors for monetary systems. And it's a terrible mistake, all right? The actual like heartbeat of an economy is not the financial sector. The heartbeat, if you wanna call it that, is people, it's like labor. It's like actual resources and people doing stuff, right? The financial sector, you gotta see, or at least the monetary system, you gotta see as being like embedded almost like nerve tendrils into like the tissues of society, all right? Imagine like if you're, use, if you're using like muscular um, metaphors, have you, guys, have you guys ever woken up in the middle of the night and your arms gone to sleep? Have you experienced that feeling? And it's like, no matter what you do, if, if, you're, if you, you can try to make your arm move and nothing will happen, all right? I can like send as many impulses towards it, but nothing's gonna occur. It's very similar with like monetary systems. Like I can, I can arrive on an island with a, with a shit ton of money, but I can't make like stuff jump out of the forest at me by like throwing money at the forest, right? You need human labor, you need people to do things, right? That's the actual like heartbeat of an economy. The monetary system is then embedded into that, especially, and you know, this is what creates these large scale systems of interdependence. This is why you wake up in the morning and you find yourself surrounded and well, you, you're always gonna be living in these little parcels of privately owned land and you have to trade to survive because you're in a monetary society, all right? And in that context, the monetary system actually acts almost like a nervous system. And the financial sector is often about manipulating the impulses to like mobilize people or to sort of like redirect labor in certain ways. And all those contracts like GameStop shares, for example, are ways of doing that in different sort of styles of contractual ways of moving people around. All right. So often the, the best thing to do when you want to learn about finance is learn about the underlying structure um, upon which all these things are built. All right. So part of my um, altered states of monetary consciousness newsletter is about like drawing these systems. Um, I can show you guys maybe like some of the stuff I've been doing. It's at a very early stage right now. But um, let me see if it's um, I did this one for Schumacher College, this this uh, presentation. I'll quickly share it, but it's like um i don't have time to go through it i was doing all the stuff around like there's a lot of stuff to do to, to go through money street systems but one of the simplest things i've been doing is showing just the kind of like basic um 
issuers of money in the society. Um, so if you want to check this out and if you want to get involved in, in like seeing what I've been doing, I've been, I've been building all these like a spaceship type um, pictures of the triple, the triple layered monetary issuance system in our society, which is one part of the structure of a monetary system. Um, and the reason I've been doing this is precisely so that people could actually have some visual imagery in their minds when thinking about the monetary system, right? Because right now, when you ask a person to think about the word money, what appears in their heads are these random objects, which are on the surface level of the monetary system, like pieces, units of cash, or like numbers and bank accounts, which are just the sort of like the, the kind of hollow um, surface layer of the monetary system, all right? So, and, and one of the reasons why we can't actually understand the monetary system is you can't actually see it, okay? So a lot of, a lot of the stuff I've been doing around, and this, this project around altered states of monetary consciousness is around actually building visual imagery so that when I say the word money, in a person's head, a huge network structure will actually appear and they can actually see these structures. Now, I'm quite far away from actually doing this, but I'm working with a bunch of people on, on, on the system. Um, but that's the kind of stuff I'm doing right now. Um, maybe I'll just quickly end off because I want to have time for discussion. But uh, once you start to actually, uh, well, I don't know if I should talk about this here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, when, basically, once you can start to see these systems, a lot of the debates in the press about money start to make a lot more sense, okay? You can start to map on all these current hot topics in global capitalism onto these, onto these sort of these models around, around monetary systems, okay? Um, so I'm just quickly, quickly going to end off this thing here because I'm getting tired and I have low blood sugar. <laughs> um, I'm going to be talking, so my new book is partially about this picture here, which is about the, um, the fact that the monetary system is currently being um, privatized even more than it currently is, okay? So it's about the war on cash. So it's about basically the fact that the entire sort of, um, all the units of money that were currently, well, our monetary system previously was a dual monetary system and jointly operated between the state and the banking sector. But it increasingly is moving towards a kind of a, a completely bank dominated system. So my new book is all about that process and how this new bank dominated monetary system is then fusing with big tech to create dystopian structures of the likes we have never seen before in human history at scales that operated billions of people, which, is all, which are levels of power that you don't see unless you're watching basically science fiction films like Blade Runner, all right? So a lot of this kind of like science fiction dystopia stuff is predicated upon um, processes of digital payment. That's a very, <laughs> too big a topic. Um, but I, maybe I'll the last thing I'll end off with, I've been enjoying our cryptocurrency systems as well. Um, I'll sort of show you some of my sketches of some like alternative monetary systems, which I've been, I work with people in alternative monetary systems as well to show you the kind of the difference in the power dynamics of, um, uh, yeah, actually I'm gonna stop now. I'm kind of like losing steam and I'm losing the plot. <laughs> so <laughs> this is what happens when you're writing books, you kind of go crazy. Uh, but yeah. I'll just show these these images where I've been sketching out these network structures and just know that there's some cool things happening in the alternative money scene. And with that, I'll stop. Uh, thank you all also for being here and sharing stories with us. And I would just like to go over some of the questions that we can go forward and hold. How can we introduce a moral compass to economics? How does, does something get reframed if we see economics as the management of our home and who is responsible for it? Um, how can we make economics part of our spiritual path or deeper purpose? Um, how can we change the goal, the end goal of economics? Because growth cannot be the possible end goal. Um, how do we ask what is sufficiency, what is enoughness, and where does wealth redistribution play into this and who's responsible for it? How do we 
create systems of accountability for ourselves and for others, not just in economics. This is kind of a fundamental thing. Anybody in a relationship will agree. And what is what is the quality of our present? I'm taking that from the poem. Um, what is the quality of our present and what would we like it to be um, as Gra Graeber would nudge us? Um, remembering that there are a lot of different movements. Some are more nihilistic and some are more directed and how do we have some sort of visionary direction in which to go towards? Um, think about, do thought experiments. Thought experiments are great for movements. Think about what it would be like if there were no markets and we were back in a much more primeval state and what would we furnish our life with? Um, thinking of monetary systems versus market markets and what came first and how can, again, flipping, flipping the context change our thinking about what's possible. Think about the heartbeat of the economy, which is labor and people, and think about the nervous system and think about the imagery, um, we're very Star Wars-y imagery uh, of the banking system and of alternative currencies. And yes, the left was definitely sexier when it spoke of the future. And I uh, want to leave it at that. So thank you all. And uh, we'll be out with a new deeper inquiry next month, probably, on narrative analysis, sharing some research on how we discriminate, how we bias, how we get manipulated by political messaging, particularly connect in connection to migration, refugees, and an evolving project that looks at class and, and financial inequality as a tool for division of marginalized communities. So join us next time. Until then, 